Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Sony Southeast Asia Alpha One Masterclass. Photography and filmmaking experience sharing by Pete McBride, a photographer, filmmaker, and a National Geographic contributor from the US. My name is Juliana and I'm going to be your host for today. We are really honored to have you to join us here this evening. Today, we have Pete McBride with us to share his thoughts and experiences on the Sony Alpha One. And we hope that you will gain more insight on how the Alpha One can bring your photography or movie creation to the next level. There will be a Q&A at the end of this sharing session, so feel free to ask any questions that you might have for Pete. To send in your questions, you can submit them in the Q&A box, which is located either on the right-hand side or the bottom of your screen, depending on the device that you are using. So for now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Pete McBride. He is a photographer, filmmaker, author, and speaker. He has over two decades of experience documenting the wonders of our planet. He has produced a portfolio of books and documentaries through his unique perspective. So with that, hey Pete. Morning, Juliana. You say morning. So can you tell us where in this world are you calling in from right now? What time is it? I am uh, calling in from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado where it's just past 6 a.m. my time. Oh my goodness. And you mean 6 yeah, six in the morning. So thank you so much for waking up and doing this presentation for us. I'm going to hand the time over to you right now. So Pete, take it away. Uh, my pleasure. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, it is a pleasure to, um, to be here today. And what I want to do today is talk to you about the Sony cameras, specifically the Sony Alpha One. And before I get into the details of the camera, I want to give a little backstory of who I am and what I do and why a camera like the Alpha One is so important to me because I like to go out into the world and work in very remote places where I don't have the, the privilege to bring a lot of equipment. Um, so having one camera that can do everything is critical for me. So I work a lot in wild places, um, looking at uh, jungle terrains where I see the, uh, the beauty of the wildlife above, uh, whether it's wild macaws, uh, they live as, um, they mate for life, remarkable birds. And I've done a lot of work in the conservation space around species that are having challenges. Now the elephant we all love, and it, um, the African elephant has faced a lot of challenges with, with population decrease, mostly with habitat, um, around their tusks, of course, with poaching um, for their ivory, but also just trying to figure out ways to find elephants to move from one area to the next because they, they require a lot of landscape. Um, it's turned their world upside down. Uh, this was a project I did where I followed um, a group that relocated 500 elephants, which is a remarkable feat. This elephant's been darted and they're putting it in a truck and moving it to another location so it can, can live successfully in a different um, area of, the, of Zimbabwe. Uh, I've worked on all seven continents from Mount Everest to Antarctica. This is an image in the Arctic where I went to document um, wildlife, not just reindeer that like to cross the fjords in the northern tip of Arctic. Amazing feat they do. They, they move north to south. Um, but I went there specifically to follow um, these animals. These are orca, often known as killer whale, which is actually an inaccurate term because they're not technically whales. They're the largest dolphin in the world. And what's amazing about them is they live all over the world. They're very intelligent species. And in order to document them, for me, I need a camera that it can that can handle anything. It can handle the cold. It can get in um, to water housings. And, and um, here it's specifically challenging because there's very little light. This is um, me getting into the water. The temperature of the water is about four degrees Celsius. Uh, and it's polar night. So the sun doesn't even come above the horizon. So I'm dealing in very dark conditions. But I was... I got quite lucky. I got in um, where the orca were feeding, and I not only got to see them, but hear them and experience them. This is a male orca, 25 feet long. The dorsal fin on the top there is about six feet long, uh, and he came right up to me. There's never been an encounter, a violent encounter, uh, with orca in the wild with human beings. Um, and this gives you a little perspective of how big that wild orca is. There's a humpback whale in the background coming into eat the herring that the orca have corralled. 
So this is an amazing experience, very spiritual for me. And I needed the, the camera, of course, that could work in these challenging situations. Uh, when I got out of the water, I was frozen, as you would imagine, but I was also elated uh, to experience such a such a majestic animal uh, swimming right next to me. Now, after I worked um, for many years um, all over the world, I decided to come home and do a project very close to where I live. This is the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. This mountain is not far from where I'm sitting here. Um, called the Maroon Bells. It's quite famous. And I wanted to do a story um, using the lightweight Alpha One and its ability with its dynamic range and fast focusing and just ability to move in very challenging situations, its dust and waterproof control, to follow what I call my backyard river, the Colorado River, which flows from the high peaks um, down through the different terrain, through the foothills famous for fishing. These are fly fishermen. Um, through the oxbows of the desert, um, and then as it moves through seven states and two countries here in the southwest of the United States, it's facing huge water shortages. Uh, we're basically drawing down the river um, rapidly because we're growing, climate change is having an effect, and we're seeing rivers like this. I took this at night with the, the amazing ability to do low light again and do star photography. You can see the reflection of the stars in the water, but this water level is very low. And what happens downstream, uh, this is a historic image that I did not take of the Gila River, which is one of the many rivers that flow into the Colorado River. That's what it looked like in the 1930s, and that's what it looks like today. So we've seen drastic changes and water shortage throughout the West. And when you come to the end of the Colorado River, the river that sculpted the Grand Canyon, it actually dries up completely and does not reach the sea. After I did this project, I was invited up to the Grand Canyon, which is in the center of the Colorado River, 277 miles of it, about 400 kilometers, to give a talk about the state of water um, in this amazing national park. And when I was there, I started hearing about how this park is changing. So I started I decided to do a project for National Geographic where I would walk the entire length of the Grand Canyon from east to west. Now that project I didn't think would be as hard or challenging when I set out. I figured it would be about 277 miles the length of the river or 400 kilometers, but it's actually much closer to about 1200 kilometers, 750 miles. Because in order to move downstream through it, you have to go up and around all the many tributaries and, and fingers. Because in order to move through this amazing broken landscape that is a mile deep, uh, what is that I'm trying to translate as I go with miles and kilometers, but it's uh, 1.6 kilometers deep um, and it's uh, 22 kilometers wide. It's a remarkable landscape. It's very broken. In order to move laterally, you have to move vertically. So every time we went downstream, we had to go up different layers of rock through geologic time. And then of course, back down, carrying all our food, our equipment. So I chose to use just one Sony camera, one Sony lens, because I needed to be as light and efficient as possible. And even with paring down all my equipment and everything, it was a tremendous toll on my body. I lost 40 pounds, um, some 20 kilom uh, kilograms, uh, because I couldn't um, get enough food and we were moving roughly 20 miles a day, um, 30 kilometers a day. But the project was not about the physical feat, it was really about looking at this beautiful landscape and the, how remarkable it is. This confluence here was the, the location of a billion dollar tram proposal. So it was about how this was getting pushed back by native tribes. Um, other native tribes working and locals working to push back on uranium mining for um, which is right on the outskirts of the mine. This is a uranium mine in the background that bores down 3,000 feet um, and they're very afraid it's going to contaminate the water. Uh, the water sources that come into the Colorado River support the park, all the wildlife, all the people that live there and 40 million Americans that rely on the drinking water of that Colorado River below. And we, as I did this project, I moved through all the seasons. I moved from winter 
Um, I started in the fall and I moved through winter into the spring and summer. The temperatures ranged from 45 degrees Celsius all the way to minus 10 degrees Celsius. So it was quite remarkable. And then at one point it even snowed over a foot, um, which was very challenging, but it also gave me the ability to get using that amazing dynamic range of the camera ability to see this landscape in a different different hue and, and colored texture, which was beautiful. And then as I moved into the very far west, we saw how commercial development is starting to change the western side of the canyon. This was roughly um, one year into hiking, we came to the western area where many people come to visit the canyon by helicopter, which is a nice way to see it, but we often forget the impacts that come with the machinery we bring into our wild places. So I showcased what one day of traffic looks like in Western Grand Canyon. This is 363 helicopters that flew through and I, I sewed them together um, in one image using Photoshop um, to just to give an example of how traffic can impact a place. Um, and it, this happens every single day. There's up to 400 flights a day. So it's, it's changing these national parks, these world parks that we really know out here. And in that part of Western Grand Canyon, it is still very grand and majestic with these slot canyons. This is this is called the Wine Room, um, very remarkable slot canyon. And you can hear those machines echoing throughout the park. So it's changing some of these secret areas. And then after 13 months of walking, uh, my friend, uh, writer, um, Kevin Fedarko, we made our last step on the western side of Grand Canyon. Um, and of course, I brought just that one camera, one lens, which worked the whole time. It's amazing what Sony can endure. Um, and this step represented, I think we went through eight pairs of shoes. We had four sprained ankles. Uh, we had hundreds of cactus injuries. I even had a heart injury. Um, we lost two girlfriends. <laughs> it was quite a project. But it was really about shining a light on this amazing, iconic um, national park, which I really would argue is a world park. It's um, one of the, it's the only canyon you can see from outer space, according to, to the NASA scientists. And I walked away with a few lessons. The first one is that when I went in for National Geographic, I figured I would focus all my energy on the scale and color and texture of this place. But one thing that surprised me was the stillness and the silence and how powerful that was and how hard it was to document that silence. And um, gratefully, the Sony has the capability of doing videos. So I did do a feature length documentary um, talking about this. And then the second element, the cousin to silence is the night sky, which many of us often don't get the chance to see so in the Grand Canyon, there is a river below the Colorado sculpting the place, but every evening there is a river of stars that sweeps overhead and is truly magical. And because the canyon's so big and there's no development inside it, it enables us to see it. Now here's a short little video snippet from my film that I did that showcases the Sony time-lapse abilities. Every night I would get up and, and run a camera with my limited power because I was charging the camera off solar power. So I had to be very careful with my how many batteries I could use, but it did an amazing job. My last takeaway lesson from the project is that if you get the chance to go to the Grand Canyon, you may look over the rim and be amazed at how big it is. And you may think, wow, this place is so empty. 
but in fact, it's not. It is incredibly full of life. And to get an image like this, I mean, it requires a very durable camera that can get in an underwater housing and, and make the mile journey down there not be too heavy. So I was delighted to have a camera like the Sony that could do this. But they, the Grand Canyon has the widest range of biodiversity of any of the national parks in the United States. And some would say the widest range of anywhere in the world. Um, but in addition to the wildlife and biodiversity, it, all ha it also has a very rich human historical footprint. There are um, incredible rich history of Native American, ancient Pueblo and people that have lived throughout the Grand Canyon. Um, those lights on the right of the image you're seeing, those are ancient granaries where they stored grain. And I lit them up with a laser light, low light again. Um, to show where these people once were. And many people ask, where have they all gone? And the answer is, they are still all here. There are 11 Native American tribal communities that live around Grand Canyon. Um, and they're still very much a part of it. And their voice is very powerful among how we protect this, this canyon going forward. And I think the goal of this project um, where I use just that one Sony camera amazingly is to showcase how can we remind ourselves of these natural wonders and and think of them not just as amusement parks, um, but also a place of reverence and like an outdoor cathedral that we, we cherish and can pass forward to next generation so they can see a similar sunrise like I saw here. Now back to the Alpha One, I had the pleasure recently to test drive the camera right in my backyard here and test every feature of of the camera and see how well it works when I'm not completely stressed by having to make miles in the Grand Canyon. So I, I took the Sony Alpha 1 up into every kind of concept that I could think of. I took aerial images up at 15,000 feet above um, the Rocky Mountains at the last little alpine glow of light, um, leaning out the window very cold temperatures to show off that dynamic range. Um, I came back to Aspen, Colorado. I'm just on the outskirts of it here. And so I, of course, wanted to showcase the, uh, the ability of low light and doing nighttime photography to showcase the town in the evening as the stars are starting to emerge. And because I grew up in this area, I love skiing. So I wanted to test out the autofocus, um, the autofocus tracking, which is incredibly, incredibly accurate, which I, I actually love for skiing. You have skier coming right at you if you're photographing them and try to kind of make that crisp um, lock in focus can be very challenging, but the, the Alpha One just nailed it. No matter who I was skiing with, no matter how fast they were going, they were uh, spectacular on how quickly it could track um, either wide or narrow um, and no matter how fast they were going. So that was a real delight to try that. Of course, I used a variety of lenses. Um, this is a 500 millimeter fixed. I wanted to see how it did with the dynamic range and landscape and um, and looking at different textures and trying black and white. And then my favorite was going out and looking for wildlife. Uh, there are Rocky Mountain elk that live where I do. And in the springtime, they get very skittish. They, they're they hungry. They haven't, they've had a, a long winter with little food and snow. So. They're very afraid of people, but they're very hungry. So they're, they're moving a lot. So they were hard to track. And what's great about the Alpha One is it has a silent shutter. So I can turn off the shutter and I can be very quiet. Um, it also has an eye tracking focus ability that will even adjust to wildlife um, eyes, which is, which is very advanced. And so I was able to get close to some of the elk, um, which I loved. Uh, tricky. It took me a few attempts, but it worked well. And then I also tested the camera, not just in my backyard, but we did some traveling uh, into Mexico City to just sort of see how the camera does in the street and in the action and when you're on the move. Um, and I love the dynamic range of it and, and seeing the color, the rich colors come out in the stills, um, whether I was in the plazas or getting down low, pulling out the back monitor to get right above the water and reflection, looking at different angles. And of course, if you're in Mexico, you have to follow the music. Um, I love mariachi and I love how this was very harsh light when I did this. So to get out and, and see the, the bright light of the hues of the white popping out with the color of the flowers and the mariachi here. 
And then, of course, the the 30 frames per second, which I can capture tack focus um, and capture things when I went out with the National Folkloric Ballet, um, I could capture those moments that my eye actually couldn't see the, the person's face, the dancer's face underneath the dress amidst all these swirls. And then the, the dynamic range of the camera is absolutely amazing to capture the rich color in this photograph um, near these ancient pyramids during the very harsh bright light of, of Mexico was, was amazing to see the disability. And whether I'm on the ground or I'm up in the air again, my one of my favorite platforms is, is aerial, even in a slow moving balloon, it was great to see how we could handle that early morning light. And of course, for me, the most important thing if you're traveling is the people. Um, you need to meet the people and that is a way that's really a doorway to where you are. And so capturing a portrait, this was a street vendor to do a good portrait. Sometimes I don't have very much time. It's not studio, I'm in the street. So I need to get that portrait. First, I need to build the confidence and, the, and my relationship with that person. And then politely ask to take the photograph. And so I only have, a, I have a very small window to make that portrait. So. To make sure I don't miss it, the, the eye tracking focus is just spectacular. It just tack on every time. So we, of course, did video because uh, I am a filmmaker. So this is a behind the scenes of every angle I tested with the camera. And it shows you just how much fun it was. And here is the camera. In fact, um, this is set up for video. So this is the exact camera I used for the video. And um, you'll see some of the samples and, um, of course, the, the color grading, focus, the dynamic range, time lapse, you'll get to see it all that I did on just one camera, which I find, find remarkable. Alpha. <sighs> I'm trying to get out and shoot some video and some still photos of uh, elk in their winter habitat without disturbing them. So I need to be very quiet, I need to be very light. Our surroundings have a rhythm that shape us. Mountains and rivers have molded me into someone who loves to explore the beat of our wild places and document them so people understand how fragile these places are. My name is Pete McBride, and I've worked as a photographer and filmmaker for years, documenting expeditions, wildlife, remote cultures, and vast, wild vistas. I grew up in the heart of the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and I never get tired of scampering up peaks, exploring the rivers below, or soaking in the sweep of moonrises and starry skies. I am often on the go, so I need one camera that can keep up with me. One that has the tools to do it all in the cold, heat, moisture, or dirt, the ingredients of any fun adventure. I found it in the Sony Alpha One. Gliding over snow is one of my favorite places to shoot. It makes my heart sing and giggle. Sweet. <laughs> no matter the weather conditions or how fast I'm moving, I need something as tough as my surroundings and the people I'm photographing. Nice. With 30 frames per second and lightning fast track focus, I don't miss the action no matter how fast the subject is moving. And when I'm filming, the Alpha One has fast and wide autofocus, including a tracking feature that allows me to follow a skier at 60 kilometers per hour down the mountain while maintaining precise focus. Finding unique perspectives is also critical for my work, and aerial platforms can offer vantages not easily seen. When you are 15,000 feet above sea level, it can be cold and windy, but also magical. I love the perspective and humility I get when I see aerial views of our amazing shared world. And during that last whisper of light, the Alpenglow, on the 14,000 foot peaks of my backyard, I need a wide dynamic range to capture that beauty and spectrum of hues that glimmer on the edge of light and shadow before dusk. The 50.1 megapixel high-resolution sensor offers incredible detail as well. 
While the mountains are my home and the source of many projects, my soul sings when I travel, especially to the hills of my ancestry. In the outskirts of Mexico City, I soaked up another aerial perch, this time a slower one. All right, we're going up and away. No matter where I am or what I'm doing, I love grabbing one camera. I can shoot 4K video in S Cinetone or S Log 3. I can speed up time or slow it down, capture dynamic landscapes, or striking portraits with focus eye tracking I can trust. And I can shoot high speed action anytime, anywhere. Having it all in one camera lets me get out more and do what I do best, find the rhythm of the place I'm in. And no matter what adventure I'm chasing, be it in the snow-swept mountains amidst wildlife, or swirling in streets full of culture and color, I've learned one thing. Life and nature are unpredictable. <laughs> I'm grateful my Alpha One is not. So no matter where you are, whether you are in the high, high snowy covered mountains or whether you are one that loves to get under the ocean and dive with our majestic creatures, this is a giant manta ray, or you love the star, starry sweep of the Milky Way in our night sky and desert landscapes, uh, it is amazing to have one camera uh, and the Alpha One is that one camera for me. And my last thing I would say is it's great to always have um, uh, a great team when you go out into the field. Um, story is very important, but it's great to have um, amazing teams. Sony has been wonderful, and it's always good to have good companionship um, in the field as well, even if they're distracting, like my uh, my friend here, Patch the dog, um, who's not looking at the subject, but um, is <laughs> was being a great uh, assistant on this job. So thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in, in my work, you can uh, follow my work at um, on Instagram. I'm, I'm not a TikToker, but I am an Instagram person uh, at Pedro McBride. And um, thank you very much to Sony for your amazing, amazing um, Alpha One camera and um, your support and, and doing this. And I think we'll go to Q&A if um, you're going to come back, Juliana. All right, thank you so much, Pete. That was really interesting. So many intimate moments. It feels like we know you as well as the Alpha One a little bit better now. Um, to our listeners, to our audience, I'm sure by now you probably have some questions to ask Pete. So feel free to send in your questions via the Q&A chat box. But for now, let me just kick off this Q&A and start the ball rolling with our very first question. Okay, so what is your favorite feature about the Sony Alpha One and why? My favorite feature is that um, even with this, this housing, um, which I use so I can get into funky positions and help stabilize, it is incredibly light and it's incredibly durable. So easy access to video stills. It's just one button away for each and I can set it up for any way I want it. Um, so I, I really think you can make this your, your, your one grab camera for everything. Um, and for me, that's the most important for what I do. So now that we're going into this Q&A sessions, of course, I want to remind our audience, if you have any questions pertaining to the Alpha One or filmmaking production workflow, feel free to send in your inquiries via the Q&A box and Pete will be more than happy to share with you his insights. But for now, we already have a couple of questions coming in. And earlier on during your presentation, Pete, you mentioned multiple times that you took with you one camera, one lens. And I think the audience is just like, can you tell me what lens that is? <laughs> We've got like four or five people just, you know, asking the same questions right now. What lens did you choose? And maybe tell us why you chose that as well. Uh, I chose the 16 to 35 um, F4 uh, because I needed a lighter lens at the time. And they, they, um, and that's just because I was so weight restricted and I wanted wide for the landscape um for the night skies the time lapses everything and so that was it um and i will i will admit as a photographer who loves gear 
to do that project and sometimes hike for days to get to a shot, knowing you have one camera and no place to charge it except your solar panel. Mm -hmm. It's very nerve wracking. Um, and uh, especially National Geographic is a tough place to work for. They have a saying that they do not publish excuses. So if I came back and said my camera broke and I missed the shot, they would say, well, that, that doesn't matter. Um, but I didn't have the luxury to carry two cameras or anything. And so the Sony, the Sony was the camera for the job. Yeah, so that brings us to our next question as well. People were really curious, hiking through the Grand Canyon, how many batteries did you go through a day? Or how did you work out the battery situation? Uh, batteries were, were difficult. Um, I would say the battery on this is, is amazing. It's, it's, it's heavily improved because I was dealing with a, an older battery system. But I had uh, five batteries. I was constantly rotating, putting them on another battery on a solar system. And when it got cold, um, I would sleep with the batteries in my armpits um, because mind you, we're not, there's no hotel we're going to, there was no camera crew. I was doing everything. Um, I'm sleeping on the dirt. I'm sleeping in a thin tent. And when it was minus, I think it was minus 10 degrees, minus four degrees Celsius, um, two feet of snow, it was very challenging. So um, battery management was every day, all the time. Um, and they worked. They were great. They uh, 71 days of, of working in the field. I ended up doing about 150 days um, out in the field, ultimately with my film project. So it's amazing to think how well that worked. That's amazing. The sacrifices that you make so that we can see these beautiful images. You mentioned batteries under the armpits. Everybody did you hear that? <laughs> Um, we've also got a question about storage issues. Moving on, so since the CF Express Type A has pretty small storage and are pretty expensive, how did you deal with that? Uh, I brought a, a wallet of, of cards. And again, this was a little bit nerve wracking, but I couldn't bring more weight. So I would use up a card and I would just turn it backwards and put it in the wallet and go to the next card. So I, I held that wallet very, very carefully, uh -huh. um, protected it uh, in a bag, in a case, and um, that was how I did it. So you had to be really careful about the shots you took then as well, I suppose? Uh, no, I had enough cards. I brought in, I think I brought in, um, I think 16 cards and I just rotated through. So it was a lot. And then I, uh, I didn't do the whole project in one stop. I came out, um, mostly to hand off cards and get those downloaded. There was too much, too much risk if I, if I carried all that content the whole way. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Okay, we do have more questions coming in. Seems like everybody is pretty interested in your thought process and some of the technical um, specs that you go through, um, especially on a journey like this. So uh, this person says, Hi, Pete. How often do you switch between or use the mechanical and electronic structures when taking pictures? And why the preference? Um, I, I usually just stick with one thing. I, uh, for me personally, I set up my camera one way. Um, I'll, 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 if I'm doing wildlife, I'll, I'll go to, um, I'll try to go to the digital shutter and make everything as quiet as possible and, and then film. So I'm not getting, um, shutter distraction, but if I'm shooting, I like to hear the shutter. So I know, but, um, there are times when, for what I'm doing, I, I guess the best answer is depending what I'm doing, I adjust accordingly. If I need a quiet camera, then I go make it as quiet as possible. Mm -hmm. If I want to know when I'm shooting and I can hear it, if I'm in a plane doing aerial, I want to hear that shutter click. Um, so I, I change it depending on what I'm doing. Sure. We've also got this question about the perfect moment. So we've seen a lot of the amazing shots that you shared during your presentation. Do you have any indicators to know when is that perfect moment to click your shutter? Um, or is there any time when you captured something you didn't expect? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I would say that there's there are those moments that are feel perfect. When an orca, a male orca, uh, the largest dolphin in the world, decides to swim up and and ping you with sonar um, and take interest in you, that seems like a perfect moment. Do not miss the shot. Those are rare. Wildlife moments can be rare. Um, but those sometimes feel like it. Um, you definitely need to make sure you're shooting. 
Um, with landscape, I I will shoot a lot um, because sometimes I think it's good to treat your camera like a notebook. Um, because if you're tired, or for me, if I'm working all the time, I may not I may not think that's a great image at the time, but I'll take it anyways. I'll treat it like um, part of the greater story. And, and then I'll come back and realize actually that moment was very important. Um, and so it's good to consistently shoot. And also I would say we live in a world where everyone's looking for the one single perfect image, um, which is great. And, and this camera is the camera for it. But keep in mind that story is what we often most connect to. Story is very important. And think of the whole story. And sometimes the one perfect image um, there's more to that than when you're telling a story. So in the Grand Canyon, there was, I needed a real rich diversity of imagery to make that story sing and tell the whole story, portraiture, um, landscape, night sky, uh, water detail. Um, so think of that too, when you're, when you're doing it. Um, I think that's important, um, because story is what we ultimately most connect to as human mm -hmm. beings. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for that question. Um, there are a couple more coming in, but I do want to remind our audience right now, if you do have any questions for Pete, do keep them coming via the Q&A box. We are receiving them live, and hopefully we get to answer your question live during the session as well. Okay, next one. Um, something that piqued the interest of many people as well. You mentioned your underwater housing. Which is the underwater housing that you currently use for your Alpha One? I use a Nauta cam. You saw an image of it in there, and uh, that's um, just one that I picked. There are many out there, but the Nauta cams work for me. And the Nauta cam is nice because you can vacuum pressurize it inside, and it has a warning light if you've lost pressure. So if you're underwater working, you you get a little advanced notice if you're getting water um, problems, which I've had, and it's a real bummer. Um, so it's great to have a camera that you can look down and be like, all right, everything's functioning well on the housing side. All right. And the, er and the ergonomics inside are very well um, engineered for, for Sony cameras. So the buttons line up with the buttons. Mm -hmm. Great. We've also got this question over here. So you do call yourself, you know, you do photo, you do film. You are also a contributor to National Geographic. What do you think would be your biggest challenge in your journey as a photographer and a filmmaker? Uh, biggest ch uh, challenge? I, I think in today's world, um, the challenge is there's, um, Sony's done such a good job with these cameras that there's a lot of good imagery out there. So the big challenge is how can you stay relevant as a storyteller? as a photographer and filmmaker. And I will come back to find stories that um, that mean something to you, um, that you connect to, and that if it connects to you and you're passionate about it, it will connect to others. Um, because there's, I can't remember what the statistics are, there's a billion photographs and there's some amazing sunsets and sunrises and um, out there. So figure out what you can do that's new and different. And that's where I think story is, is important. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge today for me is just staying um, relevant on that side of it. And, but make sure you have the right tool. And I, I, I will argue that this is one of the best tools you can have in the toolbox. So definitely. So, um, with regards to your Grand Canyon journey that you shared with us earlier on, there are a couple of questions with people who are interested in the entire um, the hike that you had to go through, right? So they're curious to know, how did you deal with your food ration during that epic Grand Canyon hike? You mentioned you lost 40 pounds, was it? Yep. That is insane. How, how did you deal with the food ration uh, issue? Uh, there is a, um, you can, there's a full feature documentary on the project called Into the Grand Canyon. I don't know if your audience gets Disney Plus, if it's reached there yet. It's on the National Geographic TV. Um, you can see the whole film. It goes into that. 
Um, but we started the project, the writer and I, we started and we carried too much weight. I had too many cameras. I had too much food. And as a result, um, I got very sick and had a lot of problems um, because the temperature was hot. Uh, it's just too challenging uh, to move with weight. So we then had to figure out and pare down all our weight. And that's where I, I went down to one camera, one lens, and then I went to two pounds of food a day. And that's, we calculated what we could needed to move and have energy to, to be efficient. And um, we did freeze dried, mostly nuts, dried fruit, um, and an occasional uh, power bar um, and one stove um, just for boiling water. And then we had friends help us leave food in the canyon that we would GPS tag called food caches. And we didn't always make them to the food cache as planned. So some, there was a few days we went very hungry, didn't have any food. But we we there was a lot of logistics to the food and the food was very challenging. But even more challenging was water. So more people have stood on the surface of the moon than have walked the entire length of the Grand Canyon, which is an interesting statistic. There's no trail. Um, a lot of the native tribal communities lived and moved through that landscape for hundreds of years, but nobody ever needed the, to walk from east to west. So it's a little silly on a certain level. But to find water when you're doing that, we had to find water every single day. And that become became even more challenging than the food and I think that was more stressful, but we were able to figure it out. And um, um, sometimes I would even use the camera um, as a way to um, kind of look through it and see if I was getting any glints of reflection that my eye wasn't seeing. And sometimes it actually helped. Oh, that's an, wow, that's an amazing story to tell. I cannot just imagine uh, the stress, just thinking of like, when am I gonna get my next sip of water? You are living, and you mentioned the crazy temperatures as well, right? The, the whole range from minus 10 to 45 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, we are currently at about maybe 34, 35 degrees Celsius in Singapore, and it's super hot. So I can only imagine um, if you're trekking through at 45 with no water on it's hand. A, it's, a, it's a different heat. It's a dry heat. So uh, a humid heat at that, I, I wouldn't be able to move, but mm -hmm. a dry heat, Feels like you're in an oven, but it's it's very tricky. It was it, it was it's dangerous, and uh, if you go to the Grand Canyon, be very mindful of temperature and um, electrolytes. Electrolytes are the biggest challenge managing your body salt um, and staying you know um, not just hydrated but um, properly balanced with electrolytes. So you did mention that you went uh, or you planned this trip with your writers, and this is of course for Nat Geo. Um, so to a certain extent, you had this trip all planned out, but how do you decide on your other projects and shooting locations um, when it comes to, to something that maybe is not for Nat Geo, for, for your own personal um, projects? Do you do the recce of these places yourself as well? I do. Uh, so you saw the Colorado River was a personal project, became a book and some films, and then I later sold that to different uh, media magazines, including National Geographic. And so I will get ideas and I will write proposals for those that are in the media world and want to tell visual stories. Um, it's good to have an idea that you want to do that you're passionate about. And if you want to pursue it, uh, don't write 40 pages, write one page. It's a busy world, as we all know, and people's attention span are shrinking. So think of ways um, to um, make it very succinct and um, interesting. Um, and then if somebody says, if you really believe in it and nobody's saying they wanna support it, I encourage people to go out and do it on your own. I've done that many times and it can be hard, but um, if you stay true to it and you believe in it, um, usually you get a great story and then you come back and people see what you've done and you, they see your passion and then they're like, oh, wow, that's great. Um, and worst case scenario, you have an amazing experience and you have a great body of work too. Hopefully images to share, stories to tell. Yeah. Definitely sounds like a project like that. <laughs> okay, we do have this question as well. Have you ever faced any difficulties with the Alpha One um, in super cold or super hot areas? Maybe LCD or battery or maybe even the, cam the camera temperature itself. Faced any issues with that? I have not. 
and I, I've um, I've done all the reading on it, and I've looked at all the challenges with with temperature and heating. I haven't had any problem, uh, and I've I've attached monitors, um, and I've I've put it to the test. So for me, it's been great. Um, I've um, run labs, two mics, uh, external monitor, and um, I haven't had any problem. Um, and for stills, um, shooting, hanging out the side of an airplane and the Rocky Mountains uh, in the winter or lying in the snow in the dirt and mud. Um, tracking elk, I haven't had any problems. So I'm I'm really impressed with that because um, I I will be honest, I'm very hard on equipment. Um, this this for me is is a tool, but it doesn't mean it's you know I don't pamper it. I need it to work, um, and so I I put it out there, and I haven't had any problems. So when it comes to temperature wise, it seems like your battery under the armpits was the most that you did. Was it? Uh, that, <laughs> the that, charging. That I'm not going to forget that one. <laughs> I don't. I, it doesn't matter who who what battery you have. Batteries do not like cold, um, and so if you're in in mountaineering or or doing what I do, that's that's a challenge for any any battery, um, and that's just an ongoing thing. So the armpit trick is 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 a good one. Very you, handy. <laughs> So we do have uh, one of our last questions over here. Based on the stories that you've told us, you've gone through extreme heat, extreme conditions, you know, even worrying about food and water. What actually motivates you to keep on exploring and shooting the things that you love? For me, I, uh, I have seen a lot of change in our world. Um, in our natural world, I've seen um, wildlife populations start to shrink. Um, I've seen my backyard river um, where I live, I've seen it no longer reach the ocean. It stopped reaching the ocean in my lifetime. It flowed to the sea for six million years and now it doesn't. Um, and so I believe it's very important that we tell stories about our natural world and, and how we can protect it so we can have have a better life. The natural world is is our house. It's it's what keeps us going. And so I, I do a lot of work around um, conservation and climate. And it can be sometimes very challenging physically, of course, um, and sometimes depressing because I'm seeing not always positive change. But it um, it keeps me going because I want to see my my um, family, my my nieces and nephew. I want to see them, give them the opportunity to see what I've seen and. I also see great hope too. I see people doing amazing things in story making and beyond, having great change in effect. And and story, I have deep belief in the power of story and imagery of making change and a difference. So um, I think it's a great way. It's a great tool to um, to make our lives and our world better. Mm -hmm. So with that, you mentioned that the documentary is actually on the Nat Joe channel. Definitely, I'm going to be checking that out tonight, maybe. Uh, we want to thank you all for your spontaneous questions. Our sincere apologies that we're unable to address all of your queries due to time constraints. But before we do end off this Q&A session, I do have one or two last questions for you, Pete. So you've spoken about a lot about your previous projects and, you know, even as you were talking about them, something that I was very excited to know is what are your future aspirations or are there any projects that you're thinking of exploring uh, and taking on with the Alpha One? Uh, yes, I am. I've actually uh, just completed the first step of a project around the concept of silence. Uh, I was so inspired by the Grand Canyon and that stillness and silence that um, I've been using the Alpha One to do film work around that. I've done a book about silence called Seeing Silence, um, basically looking at our natural sounds and, and how wildlife communicate in wild places. And I'm also um, doing a personal story about my father and um, something I think we all relate with, with aging and, and memory loss um, as we get older and the challenges there. So that'll be um, near to my heart. Um, possibly challenging emotionally, but I'm, I'm, I think it's um, an important one. And I'm, I'm glad, I, I, I'm quite glad I, <laughs> I have one camera to do it. It makes it easier on my side. So it's great. The Alpha One, thanks. 
That last one definitely sounds very relatable. And just to end off this session, do you have any message for our attendees here today? Uh, I would say, um, again, I'll go back to story. Find a story that you uh, that means something to you. And you have these great, these great cameras, these great tools out there in the world today. Go take advantage of them and use them. Um, and um, share your stories. It's important. So with that, thank you, Pete, for waking up super early today for sharing your in-depth insights. We certainly hope that every one of you have enjoyed this session. Let us also extend our appreciation to all of our audience here today for joining us. My name is Juliana. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you.